and welcome. Glad you're here in worship with us. Especially glad to have our visitors. Um, members know this, but visitors may not. At the end of at the end of your pew, or a pad, and it has little papers that you fill out, and you can say if you're a visitor, you can say if you're a member, or if you say write down if you have a special need, or if you want to make a reservation for Wednesday night. So please pass those along, and please give us a record of your presence. A couple of announcements. One of the neat things happening this upcoming week is that we as a community will be celebrating Kindness Week. As Christians, we know that we're supposed to practice kindness every week. But it's great to have this opportunity to be reminded of the special times when we need to be a little more caring, a little more sensitive, a little more aware of maybe someone's specific need that we can respond to. And whether it's a gesture or a kind word, this is your opportunity to practice kindness as a part of Kindness Week. One of the things that happened this past week, of course, was Veterans Day. And someone suggested that it would perhaps be a, an important opportunity to make sure that you think of veteran today. And as part of that, we're going to uh, be uh, initiating a, a, a new kindness gesture. And it's just for today, just based on my whim. But uh, please stand up and greet someone in your circle near you, thanking them for coming and passing a kind word to them. And now, if you'll return to your seats. <laughs> I forgot something, and my, I can't go home unless I mention this. Uh, you notice outside the uh, uh, anchor building, there's, there's a... Uh, really attractive Christmas tree and uh, a Charlie Brown tree and it has ornaments on it and it's a part of the Community Cares Toy Shop so maybe your act of kindness this week is to grab one of these ornaments it has a list of simple gifts uh, that we can purchase as a part of our community then uh, you purchase the gift it's for a family a child in need from a family of need and we put the gifts in the box and then they're gathered together and taken to a uh, warehouse where families can come, the parents of these kids can come and shop for their kids uh, for the presents that they themselves can't afford. So that may be your kindness gesture this week too. Let us continue in worship.
Please join in our call to worship from Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of hosts. And now we'll all rise for the singing of hymn number 551. me in the prayer of confession as printed in our bulletin merciful God for the things we have done that we regret for the things we have failed to do that we regret for all the times we've acted without love for the times we have reacted without thought for the times we have withdrawn care for the times we have failed to forgive. Forgive us. 
for hurtful words said and helpful words unsaid, for unfinished tasks and unfulfilled hopes. Now hear these words of the assurance of God's grace. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand. Please be seated. Now my cousin, Dave Griffin, will come up here and share with us about an extension of our knitting ministry. And at the same time, we're going to ask the children to come forward and participate in this. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. Are some of you sad because of watching some football games last night? <laughs> Let's try that again. How are you on this beautiful Lord's Day? Good. Good. I'm so glad. Okay. A couple things with me. These are really, really special to me. Can a couple of you hold one for me? Can you hold this for me? All right. Hold it tight, okay, because it means a lot. Hold it tight. Okay, I don't, I don't even think I can let you hold this one. This, I'm going to have to hold this one myself. Okay, what do you see behind you on the steps? What are these? You see some blankets. What else do you see? There's one on each side. Hayden, what's behind you back there? A bag, yes. Do you see this bag over here? What? Do any of your suitcases look like this? No. And I'm, I'm kind of upset that mine doesn't. I think I'm going to have to send these with Miss Pretty and mine with Miss Pretty so that mine can be like this. But look at these bags. Aren't they cute? What do you see on them? Thunder. Yeah, lightning bolts, spaceships. What else? What's on mine? What is this? Turtles. Aren't these awesome? Yes, these are so cool. Okay, Miss Pretty and Mr. Dave are going to tell us a little bit about these bags and what's inside them. You got the drum roll. Okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was back in eighth grade teaching again. <laughs> All it takes is one person, an idea, and a little bit of passion, and the world can change. Maybe it changes just a little, and maybe that's all it needs to change. Maybe that change doesn't show up on the, Monday, uh, the evening news or make it around the water cooler conversations at the office. But what if that change was good enough just for one person? What if that one person was a child? Maybe a child who finally realized that someone really does love them. 
You see, many times their world is feared with is filled with fear, hate, and abandonment. Many of them believe the world doesn't care and doesn't want them. They believe that they're worthless. For in their mind, they may be no better than the trash and garbage cans. You see, foster kids face this every day, this fear that today may be their last day, their last time to eat in this house, the last time to sleep in their bed. Maybe it's the last time for them to go to that school. Because their fear is that at any moment, a defax worker will come through the door and tell them, okay, it's time to go again. They give them just enough time to gather their stuff. Maybe it's their shoes. Maybe it's a change of clothes, a jacket if they have one. But what do they need to carry these things in? Oh, no worries. Defax provides a nice, clean garbage bag. Garbage bag. And we wonder why they believe that they're worthless. About a year ago, the Raise Me Up Foundation became aware of this situation, and due to the high numbers of children rolling through the Henry County Foster Care Program, their budgets struggle to keep up with the needs of these children. So much so that the practicality of a garbage bag to carry a child's stuff makes great financial sense. But sure, it's practical, but what message are we sending these kids, those that have already lost so much? So after conversations with the county and DFAX officials, we came up with an idea, and the idea is to provide these kids with duffel bags, bags they can call their own. Many of these bags are going to be personalized with, as you can see, the artwork and such. This is a bag where they'll be able to keep not their stuff, but their world, unfortunately, at this time, zipped up and protected. As the conversations and, and planning for these bags went on, the ideas evolved into what other items could be included, and one item that was an absolute yes was that each bag would have something that reflected our love, God's love, something that they could hold on to and know someone, God too, was thinking, th thinking of them and praying for them. Those items we named loveys. You may see them up and down the pews on the, on the sides. This was something that we knew they could hold on to and to know that God was praying with them. These little blankets, because of the compassion and the hard work of our knitting ministry here at MPC and all those that were dedicated to this project, made these blankets, filled them with compassion and prayers. Now, Pretty has a blanket of her own that she has a note that's from our MPC knitting uh, ministry she'll share with you In honor of Pretty's father, uh, Bula Patel, who was always one who was quick to give to those who are in great need at any time, these bags and these loveys will begin being, de uh, being um, delivered to the kids on February 10th, which was, would have been his birthday. They'll be filling these duffel bags with other items, uh, toiletry items, as well as books and journals and stuff for the kids to have as their own. Uh, but these loveys will be tucked neatly inside and filled with your love and prayers. So today, we ask all of you to join us in offering our prayers over these loveys so that each child who holds one during those dark and scary moments in their lives can be reassured that God's love never abandons anyone. So if you guys wouldn't mind, stand up. If you can, those on the end, touch the loveys and then hold hands across.
as you reach out and touch one of these lobbies, I encourage you to picture the child's face, the face of a child who will receive these as we pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the warmth of your love that surrounds each of us. Lord, we lift up each of these lobbies as they are sent out to bless one of your children. As they snuggle within the dark of night, remind them of your light and presence with them. As they place it on their shoulders, remind them of your warmth and love. And we thank you for all of the love and care that went into each stitch. Lord, we thank you for this ongoing ministry that you have given us to care for your children as you care for us. And so, Lord, we would pray for these, each of these children that as they seek to find a true home, that they would find it in you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So how exciting that we get to be a part of such a wonderful ministry, right? And we're going to write some really great notes to go along with these lovies so that they know that the children here are also praying for them. So I have brought with me three special lovies. What, baby? Sure. I brought with me three special lovies from our house. Okay, and this is mine. It looks a little different from those. It's a little older than those. But this is my lovey. And its name is Emi. And I still sleep with it every single night. From the time I was um, about Eliane's age, I've slept with this every single night. So I know the importance and the comfort that something like this brings you when you're home in your bed and when you're far from home and feeling a little afraid. This is Bitty Bitty, and this is one of our lovies that Eliane had, and this is Coon, one of our other lovies. So lovies hold a special place in our heart, and it can bring so much comfort and joy, and we want these children to remember that they are always loved and welcomed home by our God. Let's close in prayer before we go. What, baby? Oh, now it's her baby dolls. Okay. Even baby dolls need love. That's right. Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you so much that you love us as your own, God, and that we are your children no matter where we live or where we're from. We pray, God, that we would also extend that love to everyone we come in contact with, that they would see the joy of you shining through us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's walk to Children's Church. Friends, one of the many ways we know that, yes, Jesus does love us is by his invitation to come to him in prayer, to share our joys and our concerns. And we have had many joys to share the past couple of weeks. We had our Kirkland of the Tartan and Reformation celebration two Sundays ago. Last Sunday, Consecration Sunday, we gathered for one worship service where we as one body came forward to the one table to receive the gifts of Christ's body and blood sacrificed for us and also to offer ourselves in return to God through our time and talents and financial offerings. A great day of celebration, and the celebration continues today. As you will see, we have two roses. We want to congratulate Eamon Deal and Morgan Rutledge on the birth of their son, Patrick Fitzgerald. And also we congratulate Ryan and Sarah Kistler on the birth of their son, Everett Williams. I also call your attention to the members listed in our bulletin, as well as family of our members and friends who continue to need prayers for healing and for recovery from surgery and treatment. And certainly today, we want to lift up in prayer the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas, as they gather in a few minutes for worship for the first time on a Sunday morning since the tragic shooting last week. So let us remember them in prayer. We will hear these words from the psalmist in a minute, but they do form a good foundation for our prayers now. On the day I called you, you answered me. 
You increased my strength of soul. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we prayed earlier for the children in our community, we are reminded that you are God and Father of all of us, your children. Lord, we thank you for calling us to be part of your family, commissioning us to our family mission, calling us to be like you, even making us in your image. Lord, forgive us for how we tarnish that image in ourselves and in one another each day, for the ways we fall short of living up to our family name. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to show us what it means to fully obey you, to be obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Jesus, we thank you for claiming for us what we could never do for ourselves, for claiming for us not only eternal salvation, but life to the full, which begins even now. And so, Jesus, help us to experience life to the full, not just for ourselves, but by offering that life to others. Lord, we would pray for those in our midst who are in need of encouragement, or peace, comfort, and healing. We celebrate with those welcoming new children. We thank you for our veterans, for their service and sacrifice for you and for our country. And Lord, we would pray for those who gather in church pews just like us in Sutherland Springs, Texas, who are looking for you, looking to you for hope and peace and comfort. Lord, we lift up others on, in our hearts, those named and unnamed, for we know that they do not go unnamed to you. And so we would pray for every dark corner of this earth, every place that suffers from strife, from injustice, that your light and your power would reign. And Lord, we would pray for that for our own lives, that you would reign in our hearts, that we might be strengthened in our soul and empowered to strengthen the soul of others. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to that end. We pray for that end as we join together and saying the prayer our Savior Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
You've heard me make many comments about our music ministry, and today I'm excited that I finally get to hear our handball choir perform. And so we are so grateful for you and your ministry as you offer yourselves to God and leading us in worship. What a beautiful, beautiful celebration. And now we also have the privilege of offering ourselves to God by giving of our tithes and additional offerings.
Gracious God, we do offer our praise and thanks to you. As a portion of the gifts you have given us, we return some of them to you. We pray that you would use them for your service and your glory to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we remain standing, let us join together in hymn number 555. Now thank we all our God. Please be seated. As we turn to God's word, let us turn to God again in prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you may have noticed there is a bit of a Thanksgiving theme to today's service. Yes, I know it's a little early, and no, I did not forget that we have one more Sunday to go before Thanksgiving, so why talk about Thanksgiving this Sunday? Well, first, the theme of Thanksgiving connects well with our stewardship focus over the past few weeks. And second, this year I feel the need to defend Thanksgiving a little bit. We as a nation have always had a tendency to get ahead of ourselves when it comes to a holiday, but this year in particular, it feels like, feels like we're rushing it. I mean, Halloween decorations were in the stores before school had even started. And I don't know about you, but it felt like before trick-or-treaters even had time to sort their loot and jack o lanterns were turned into pumpkin pies, radio stations were playing Christmas music. It's as if we forgot about Thanksgiving altogether. And there's another reason, a more important reason, why we we're focusing on Thanksgiving a little early. We will get to that in a minute. But for now, hear these words of thanksgiving from the psalmist. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength. Of soul. In the New Testament, we turn to Luke chapter 17. Most of the chapter consists of Jesus talking. We don't find the re record of the disciples saying much except for one simple yet profound request in verse 5. Lord, increase our faith, they asked. 
the entire chapter is based around that request. Sometime later today, I encourage you to take a moment to hear what Jesus tells them about how to increase their faith. How faith increases through forgiveness, both the giving and receiving of it. Reading through the chapter, you hear how faith increases when we believe that through God all things are possible. How faith increases through humility. When we seek for Jesus to increase and us to decrease. And finally, in today's text, how faith increases through two words. Thank you. Listen for God's word from Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as many of you know, James and I moved to Atlanta this week. It's actually our first home we've bought together in our 11 years of marriage, so we're pretty excited about it. It's also a little daunting when you haven't moved in almost nine years. Until last week, I think I took for granted what it was like to be able to wake up and make myself a cup of coffee without having to hurdle a dozen bottle boxes just to get to the coffee pot. But now that we're in our home, we are excited, and before we talked about going out of town to Birmingham for Thanksgiving, but now we thought, we have this new home. Let's make our first Thanksgiving dinner together for my mom. Apparently, we decided that moving into a new home wasn't enough of a challenge for this month. <laughs> Over the past week or so, I've heard many of us talk about the first time we made Thanksgiving dinner or how your mom always insisted on making Thanksgiving dinner for you long after you'd grown up and established your own family and other memories. My favorite Thanksgiving memory was the year James and I got engaged. We spent the holiday weekend in Augusta, Georgia, so James could meet my extended family on my mother's side. A bit of background about my mom's family. My mom has three sisters. All of the men in our family married into the family. So I introduced James to my uncles when we arrived, and they enjoyed some lighthearted jokes and small talk before dinner. And shortly after dinner, my three uncles called James into the den to talk with him and promptly closed the door behind him. Since this was the first time he had met my extended family, I peeked my head in just to check on him and make sure he's enjoying himself, and I admit I was curious to hear what exactly they were telling him. And I was quickly shooed out the door because they said they wanted to tell James what abused women, my mother's maiden name, what abused women were like. How we are stubborn. We abuse women like the word determined better. How we are tenacious. Once we get our minds fixed on something like a dog after our bone, we won't stop. How we would do anything for whatever we believe in or whomever we believe in. I have very good uncles. We all have traits and characteristics that run in our family, don't we? We may even brag about them, saying things like, you're a griffin, or that's how Garcias behave. <laughs> our looks, our personalities, our mannerisms, they all speak to the family in which we belong. And so it is with God's family. Mike said earlier that one of the traits of our family is kindness. Kindness week is every week. One of the traits in our family is that of thanksgiving. That's our family legacy. The invitation from God's word for us to consider today is how well are we living up to our family legacy? 
we might think we're doing pretty well at giving thanks this month, we have a national holiday dedicated to it. But as we know, that wasn't always the case. At various times in our history, our presidents have sought to establish a national day of thanksgiving, often meeting resistance from those who felt like the trials and tribulations of a few pilgrims didn't warrant a national holiday, or why should we as a country waste a whole 24 hours on giving thanks? Even once the holiday was established, the date was still debated. It's been said that Roosevelt wanted the date moved up earlier in November in order to create a longer Christmas shopping season. That motion was defeated, at least in legislature. But it seems Roosevelt didn't have much to worry about because merchants have their own way of extending the Christmas shopping season by beginning Black Friday sales next week. Despite the resistance, a national holiday, of course, was ultimately declared. Listen to the rationale of that declaration. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever-watchful providence of Almighty God. These great gifts are the gracious gifts of the Most High God. They should be gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens to set apart and observe a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in heaven. These are the words of Abraham Lincoln on October 3rd, 1863, in the middle of the Civil War. When we found ourselves living as a divided nation rather than United States, when we lashed out at one another in anger and violence, Lincoln called us to focus on not on that which divides us, but the one thing that can truly unite us, the blessings of Almighty God. The context of that first Thanksgiving feast in the 17th century in which we base our holiday meal also had its share of challenges. Given that their flour supply had long been depleted and there was no Publix bakery to fill the gaps, there were not a lot of pumpkin pies being passed around their table. But what they lacked wasn't the focus, but rather what they had, a bountiful harvest after a devastating winter. Those are the two contexts on which we base our Thanksgiving holiday. Think about that for a second. When are you and I more inclined to call for a day or even just a moment of Thanksgiving? During times of war or times of peace? When our team wins or our team loses? When things are going well or not so well? When we are sick or when we are healed? We may be quick to assume that we'd all offer our thanks if we experience some miraculous healing. But our story in Luke begs to differ. The story starts off pretty textbook according to Levitical law. Lepers were considered outcasts of society due to their disease. As a result, the law required them to stay away from the general public. So these ten stuck to the sidelines, calling out from a distance to Jesus. Jesus responded also in accordance with the law, telling them to go and show themselves to the priests, the one group of people who could declare them clean. As the ten turned to go, so the story also takes a turn as one of the ten breaks protocol and makes a U-turn. Ten percent. Not exactly a good return rate. We might, like Jesus, might be tempted to draw attention first to the other nine, Yet before we judge the other 90%, perhaps we can sympathize, even empathize with them. The other nine, presumably Jewish, were not just trying, were just, just trying to be dutiful and follow the law and do what Jesus said to do. They knew God's word. They knew the only one who could tell them, they knew that one would only be told to go to the priest if healing had occurred, or in their case, would occur. If they believed God's word, 
If they believed Jesus, they would obey, and they did. You can't fault them for obedience. They were just ordinary people trying to live by the standards of God's law. But gratitude moves us beyond the standard, beyond the ordinary. And one of the ten chose to make that turn from being just ordinary to being extraordinary. The other nine kept going about their business. Maybe they were planning to return another day. Maybe they figured they'd just ask Siri to remind them to tell Jesus thanks the next time they talked to him. Or maybe they were a bit skeptical and decided, you know what, I'm going to wait and see if this cure is real and lasting before I acknowledge it. Or maybe, maybe they expected Jesus to cure them because they had been faithful and obedient. Maybe they had had begun to take God's blessings for granted, looking at life not in terms of what they had been given, but what they had been owed. Maybe obedience and duty had given way to privilege and entitlement. Maybe this isn't a first century story, but a 21st century story. At various points in my life, I've kept a gratitude journal. Every day I would write down something for which I was grateful. Some days were easier than others. Some days I could write down some big thing, like a family member who'd been cured from some illness or some big success at work or at school. Other days I struggled to find even little things, like I'm thankful the coffee was hot this morning. That's actually a big thing in my book. However big or small, every day I would write down at least one thing for which I was grateful and make a point to thank God for that blessing. But over the years, I stopped keeping that journal as other things began to take a higher priority. In fact, when I thought about pulling out one of those journals this weekend to remind myself of God's blessings, admittedly it occurred to me they were probably buried deep inside some dusty storage bin that had been in our old garage and now has been moved to the basement. We are at once again collect dust. Author and pastor Tim Keller says, gratitude is what you feel. Thanksgiving is what you do. We may feel the feeling, but we often stop short of the doing. Instead, we let our gratitude gather dust as well. One of the ten chose not to let the dust settle on his feet before he turned back to say thanks. His turning back wasn't actually the turning point. The turning point wasn't what he did, but what he saw. Verse 15 says, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. Now, leprosy was a very visible disease manifesting itself in all kinds of skin lesions and malformations. A cure to such a disease would have been equally visible. Scripture says all ten were cured, but only one saw that he had been healed. The cure must have been much more than simple sight, for if all ten were cured, all ten would have seen as much. But one of them sees something that ran more than skin deep. In Greek, the word translated healing is elsewhere translated salvation. When leper number ten saw that he was healed, he saw not only that he had been healed physically, but that he had encountered someone who who could heal him spiritually as well. And he was a Samaritan, Luke points out. Someone whose racial roots presumably meant he was an outcast and insensitive to God. Seems he was quite sensitive after all. A few weeks ago, I shared a quote by Father Tom, a Catholic priest I met on a mission trip in Kenya. Father Tom said, in life, it's not about what you do. It's about what you see out of which you do. What do you and I see when we look at our lives, at our church, at our community, at our world? If we aren't seeing beyond the surface, if we aren't seeing people and situations and events around us in a way that makes us want to go from seeing to doing and acting, then maybe we need to take a second look and see what leper number 10 saw. He saw not just the gifts, he saw the giver. 
And at that sight led him to respond, because if experience of the gifts was so great, imagine how much greater was the, it was to experience the giver himself. And so he turned back to Jesus, and as he did, he fell down at his feet. And Jesus affirmed him, not so much for the faith that asked for healing, but for the faith that returned to give thanks, saying, your faith has healed you. Or to use the other Greek meaning, your faith has saved you. While the others had been given the gift of healing of their bodies, this man also found the key to the healing of his soul. It is a grateful faith not a gimme faith that saves us. How do we learn to live that kind of faith, to go from living an ordinary life of taking things for granted to an extraordinary life of taking things for gratitude? We learn by getting up and getting a move on. Notice the movement in this text. As the ten were went, they were healed. We read all kinds of other miracles in scripture where Jesus healed them in an instant. And here too, Jesus could have healed them in a moment. Instead, he chose to heal them as they went on their way. He could have healed them in a moment, but instead he chose to heal them in a journey. The same is true of the one leper's gratitude. When he returned to Jesus to say thanks, Jesus turned him right back around saying, get up, and go on your way. Gratitude is not about a moment, but a movement. When we turn in gratitude to Jesus for his blessings, we discover that he immediately turns us right back around and sends us back out to be a blessing to others. For as followers of Jesus Christ, Thanksgiving isn't just a day. It's a way of life that can transform our lives and the lives of everyone around us. When James and I were on that mission trip to Kenya, we saw some of the poorest of the poor. We also saw some of the richest of the rich, and as is true in many countries, we saw the great gap between them. But we also saw an example of a couple that tried to bridge that gap. On our last day there, we had lunch at the home of Papa and Mama Chico. Papa and Mama Chico's house was without question one of the nicest, fanciest houses in which I've ever been in any country. They'd built and moved into the house just a couple of years earlier, shortly after donating their previous home to a mission. I asked Mama Chico how she felt God's leading her to donate her home. She said she had lived in that house for many years. All seven of her children were raised there. And while she lived there and cared for her children, she saw other children in need in the surrounding community. She would help find tutors for children who needed help with school or homes for those who were abandoned. All the while, while she was in the process of helping these children, she continually prayed that God would show her how else God might use her and the gifts God had given her. And she began specifically asking God how God might use the gift of her house. Their former house was equally beautiful. It was a place full of memories of raising a family. It was paid for. And it would make for a nice, comfortable place for them to retire. But Mama Chico knew it wasn't their home. She knew everything they had belonged to God. And so she prayed about her house every day for three years. All that time, unbeknownst to her, Some 4,000 miles away, a church in Virginia was praying for God to help them find a home for an orphanage in her very neighborhood. And in God's time, those two prayers became one. Who knows what prayers God might use us to answer if we, too, entrusted to God what God has entrusted to us. If we were to cling to the giver more than we cling to the gifts. If we were to open, hold on to our most treasured gifts, not with a clenched fist, but with an open hand. Maybe that treasured possession is something material, like a house or a car. Maybe it's a love for your own children that God is transforming into a love for our community's children. Maybe it's time or some hidden talent or gift that to you seems ordinary, but in God's hands is extraordinary. 
go back again in history and we find that was the original intent of our nation's Thanksgiving holiday. In calling us to set aside a day of thanksgiving and praise, Lincoln also called us to a day of prayer and service. The thing I also recommended them that while offering up the ascriptions due to God for such blessings, they do also commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are engaged, and to fervently implore the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it to the full enjoyment of peace. It may not be 1863, but I don't have to tell any of us that there is still civil strife in our nation and in the world's nations. There are still wounds in need of healing and peace that needs to be developed. We've named some of them already, foster children in need of a home. A church in Texas worshiping this very hour in the midst of terrible grief and loss. We could name many more. God who cares for the orphan, the widow, the mourner, the sufferer, the leper and non-leper, the nine Jews and the one Samaritan, all people. God calls all of us to to acts of thanksgiving that heal wounds and bring peace. That all might see the Savior and begin their own movement back to him. Do you remember that request of the disciples? Lord, increase our faith. In response, Jesus says, faith turns back to say thank you, and then faith turns back again to do thank you. May God so increase our faith this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand and join together in our closing hymn, number 422, God who's giving knows no ending.